Amen, my brothers. It's good to be here with everyone. I'm excited to preach God's word tonight. And you know what? We're just going to get right to it because I know we have the men here tonight. Let's turn our Bibles. To the book of John, amen. John chapter 16. It reads here in verse 33. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. What an amazing scripture from Jesus Christ. He promises to you this evening, guys, that you will have trouble in your life. Did a brother in your household eat your cereal this morning? You can overcome that, amen. Did you drive through traffic this morning? Jesus says you can overcome that too. The Bible says there we can overcome everything because Jesus Christ himself already overcame it. Therefore, he says... Take heart, because I have overcome the world. And that's the title of my message tonight, Take Heart. Let's turn our Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 36. You know, the heart is such an important organ. Without the heart, you will not have oxygen. Without the heart, you would not live. Thank you. And so the, God, how he created us was with the heart. The life comes from the heart. The blood flows through the heart. It's all about the heart, guys. And in Ezekiel 36, God has a message for his people about their hearts. My first point is a change of hearts. In Ezekiel chapter 36, we're going to pick it up in verse 16. It says, again, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, when the people of Israel were living in their own land, they defiled it by their conduct and their actions. Their conduct was like a woman's monthly uncleanness in my sight. So I poured out my wrath on them because they had shed blood in the land and because they had defiled it with their idols. I dispersed them among the nations and they were scattered through the countries. I judged them according to their conduct and their actions. And wherever they went among the nations, they profaned my holy name. For it was said of them, these are the Lord's people. And yet they had to leave his land. I had concern for my holy name, which the people of Israel profaned among the nations where they had gone. Therefore, say to the Israelites, this is what the sovereign Lord says. It is not for your sake, people of Israel, that I am going to do these things. But for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you have gone. I will show the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, the name you have profaned among them. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, declares the sovereign Lord, when I am proved holy through your very eyes. For I will take you out of the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you back into your land. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart, and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. What a powerful message from God. You know, back in this time, the Israelites, they were struggling a little bit, amen? And it says what they were doing, their actions, their conduct, it was not pleasing to God. In fact, it hurt God. He hated it. He did not like it. So what did God do? It says he scattered them among the nations. They were taken away from their homeland into foreign countries. And the Bible says that they were scattered because of one thing. Because they profaned his name through idols. Through idol worship. You know, Israel was God's people. But what's interesting is as you read through the Old Testament... The Israelites actually believed in many gods. They had one true God. But the temptation and the struggle they faced every single day was that there were all these nations around them. 
and they had their own gods, and they believed that they were actually gods. And some of them even worshiped them, right? It's interesting for us, right, because we're in a Christian nation to understand this concept, but they believed in the idea of many gods. And that's why they so easily turned to these other gods. They believed God was a god, but there were these other gods that could help them, that could save them, that could cure them from everything that they're going to. And so when God Almighty was in convenience, they turned to the other gods and worshiped them. You know, it's no different for our Christianity today. Christianity today, religiosity today, churchianity today, they all worship idols. Now you may be asking, Hugo, well, I don't see them worshiping Zeus or any statues or any monuments. So what are you talking about? That they worship other gods. Well, an idol is just worshiping something as your God. It comes before the one true God. Therefore, an idol can be anything you worship as your God. It does not have to be a statue. It doesn't have to be a monument. It could be anything in your life. You know, today, there are a lot of idols that exist, even in America, in our very own homeland. You know, some of the idols that exist today, one of them is sports. Now, we all have men here, right? And I'm pretty sure all of us love sports. I know I love sports, and uh, I forgive Adrian Keller for preaching blasphemy earlier in his welcome, right? But sports is very valuable amongst the men, right? We have the Los Angeles Rams here. We have Los Dodgers, right? We have the L.A. Lakers with LeBron himself. But what happens? You know, the NFL was created in this Christian nation. And they love America. They love the ideals. And they just so happened to decide that when would be the NFL games? On Sunday. But if you believe in God, if you believe in Christianity, when do you go to church? On Sunday. And yet, these Christian managers, these Christian players... And teams, they decide to worship, not worship God on Sunday, but worship their idol of sports. You know, money is definitely a big idol in this country. We're in the capitalistic country of America. And there's great opportunity. In fact, many people from different nations move here because they understand money is more attainable here than everywhere else. I was reading this statistic. It says... 31% of single job holders and 58% of multiple job holders work on the weekends. That's a lot of people. Americans have longer work weeks, work more weekends, and work more night hours than other industrialized countries. We're workaholics. That's how you can basically define that. We work so much that when we finally have time, to read our Bibles, to pray, to go to church, we say, you know what, I'm too tired because I've been working so much. Work, money can become an idol. You know, even school can become an idol. The American dream, right, you turn 18, where do you go? You go to college. We pack up our schedules with five, six, seven classes a semester because we want to graduate early. But then what happens? You have so much homework, you have so many exams, it's hard to make time for your relationship with God. You know, now sports, work, school, right, these aren't bad things in and of themselves. But people start worshiping them as their very own idols. These idols created in the Israelite times were made of different metals and different stones. And just like these created images, when they turned from their gods, their hearts was turning just like those idols. The Bible says they had a heart of stone. Their hearts turned exactly like the idol they worshipped. And their heart just became filled with what they believed was their God. You know, 
There was spiritual death because of this idol worship amongst the Israelites. So when God looked down from heaven, his very own heart was hurting because the people's hearts were turning to stone. God was concerned about his people. You know, I can relate to this. And uh, it's very cliche of me to say this, but now that I'm a dad, I truly understand how God feels toward his children. Amen? Um, I'm sure some of the dads can relate to me now. <laughs> you know, my son, he's about five months old. But I remember when Paulina was first pregnant. That's my wife. And uh, the baby was about 36 weeks in. And uh, about 40 weeks, that's when the baby is to come, right? So about 36 weeks, we go for our regular checkup. And uh, the doctor uses a, what's called a Doppler to measure the heart rate of the baby, right, in the womb. And the heart rate is, like, super fast. It goes, like, uh, 160 miles or miles. Yeah, 160 miles. He's running in there, guys. 160 beats per minute, right? It's very fast. Think about that, right? That's like as fast as your heart rate goes when you work out. That's the normal heart rate, the resting rate of a baby in the womb. So as she's measuring the heart rate of the baby, right, this is what it sounds like. Just like that, right, for a very long time. And uh, you hear some static, you know, because it's in the womb. He's moving around and sloshing, right, all that placenta, right. So it's kind of hard to hear the, the heart rate. But the doctor, like, makes that twitch. She's, she's like, and she's like, did you hear that? I'm like, yeah, I hear a lot. And then she's like, no, 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 did you hear that? She said, the heart rate dropped. And I was like, what, what do you mean the heart rate dropped? What does that mean? It means the heart stopped beating for one beat. And I was like, what? What do, what do you mean? What's, what's wrong? What's going on? And she says, well, it's, it's kind of, it can kind of happen. It's normal. Right? But I'm going to send you to a specialist to make sure that everything is okay. Now, the specialist appointment was two weeks later, right? And the whole time, my mind is freaking out. I'm concerned about my baby. I'm concerned about my son. Is he going to be okay? Is he going to be just fine? Is he going to be born healthy? Or is something going to be wrong right when he's born? And this whole time, I'm anxious. I'm concerned. I'm worried. That's all I could think about. And I had to wrestle with God in prayer every single day because I was worried about my son. Finally, we arrived to the specialist. And they look at his heart, and his heart is completely healthy. You see him now? He's a big boy, amen? He was born just fine. But this showed me how God felt about the people when their hearts turned to stone. Because when their hearts turned to stone... There was no beating. There was no life. It was dead. And God is always concerned. What he wants to do tonight is change our hearts, brothers. He wants to change your heart of stone into a heart of flesh that now lives for God every single day. Amen. Let's turn our Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1. As we close out in this scripture. No, I believe God is calling us to have a change of hearts tonight in every way of our lives. First Peter chapter 1 verse 22. It says here, now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. Let's stop here. You know, Peter says, now that you have purified yourselves, do these things. You know, the moment in time when you got baptized, you purified yourself from all sin, from all idols in your life. And he says, because of that, we should obey the truth so that you have sincere love for one another. You know, God's heart is for the hearts of all mankind. And when I look here tonight, I see hearts of flesh who want to obey God's word, who want to love God sincerely and love the people around them. But he wants us to have an eye for those who are not here tonight. He wants us to understand that those who are not a part of God's kingdom need a soft heart, 
They need a change of heart. But it starts with you obeying the truth. Where do we find the truth? In the Bible. In the word of God. You see, the way you change your heart, brothers, is when you have your daily quiet times and your daily prayer times. This is how God designed our heart of stone to change from a heart of flesh. You know, God, I appreciate even what's coming around the corner, right? A special missions contribution. If there's anything that exposes my heart, it's money, amen? And God designed in the kingdom that we should contribute to world missions by raising funds, by setting goals to help the nations around us, to help change their hearts. And I hope tonight you see God wants to change your heart, even about special missions. What are you trying to do with special missions? You see, the Bible says here, you must have love, love one another deeply and sincerely from the heart. When you give towards special missions, it's not because you're trying to hit your goal. It's not because you're trying to look good amongst the church and the brothers. It's because you love one another deeply and you want to save the souls around the world. You see, special missions is meant to change your heart, brothers. It's meant to change your heart of stone into a heart of flesh. Because God pushes us to care more, not about ourselves, not just about our local church, but about those around the world. This is a great opportunity. And how have you been taking up this opportunity? Have you just been letting it go by? Have you not been thinking about it? Have you not been contributing to special missions? My brothers, then you have a heart of stone tonight. Because the heart of flesh cares about those around them. I want to encourage everyone tonight that maybe you haven't contributed just yet to our special missions. Or maybe you're not close to your goal. Have a change of heart tonight, brothers. Let's make it our mission, our goal to meet our special missions goal by next week on Special Mission Sunday. And to God be the glory. Amen. Amen, family. Get to see my brothers in the house. I have a longer title for my lesson. It's the lesson Satan refused to learn and is too embarrassed for anyone to know about it. Turn with me to Ezekiel chapter 28. And I really believe this is a dangerous lesson because if you know one of Satan's darkest secrets and his biggest failures, you might overcome and you might put yourself up above him and think that you're actually better. And in Ezekiel 28, verse 11, this here, it's a scripture about Satan. And it talks about him in heaven. In verse 11, or sorry, verse 12. Can I get an amen when we're there? Amen. This is what the sovereign Lord says. You were the model of perfection. Full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. And this is talking about Satan as an angel in heaven. This is who he was before his fall. You were the model of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone adorned you. Ruby, topaz, and emerald. Chrysolite, onyx, and jasper. Sapphire, turquoise, and beryl. Your settings and mountings were made of gold. And on the day you were created, they were prepared. You were anointed as a guardian cherub. For so I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in your ways. From the day you were created till wickedness was found in you. Through your widespread trade... You were filled with violence and you sinned. So I drove you in disgrace from the mount of God. And I expelled you, O guardian cherub, from among the fiery stones. Your heart became proud. And on account of your beauty, and you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth. I made you a spectacle of you before kings. 
By your many sins and dishonest trade, you have desecrated your sanctuary. So I made a fire come out from you, and it consumed you. And I reduced you to ashes on the ground in the sight of all who were watching. All the nations who knew you are appalled at you. You have come to a horrible end and will be no more. And so what we actually see is, is that before Satan really became Satan and was thrown and hurled to the earth, uh, we see that he was the guardian cherub. He was the top decorated angel in all of heaven. He was lifted up in an incredible way, yet wickedness was found in him. And, uh, you know, I'd love to hear a response. You, you know, why was Satan kicked out of heaven? Like, what was it? Pride. It was pride. He wanted to be like God. But it gets even deeper. So turn with me to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1 in verse 26. Genesis 1, 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all creation that moves along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And so we see that finally God has decided to make mankind, and he makes us in his image. Isn't that awesome? Like, our God is amazing. He's so incredible, and he chooses to make us just like him. Isn't that awesome? And it's amazing because all of us are so different. We come together, and you get to see, like, different aspects of God through different people. You know, and even we get to see different aspects of God through the sisters, amen? You know, so it's like, it's like wow, and all it, it all encompasses God in an incredible way. And so where would Satan have a big problem with that? Well, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 2. And in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 6, and it's a reference to Psalm chapter 8. Where the Bible says, what is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him. You made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor and put everything under his feet. So now knowing that Satan is the top dog in heaven and God suddenly decides to create man. And from the scripture here, what we see is that mankind is actually below the angels. But look at Hebrews 1 verse 14. We see it says, Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? And, uh, and in 1 Corinthians 6 verse 3 it says, Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more the things of this life? So where am I going with this? Is that, is that Satan was the top in heaven? And God decides to create man. And a part of this plan is, is he creates mankind and, and is going to be in God's image. And they're going to be lower than the angels. But in due time, mankind is going to be lifted up above the angels. And the angels are going to be ministering spirits to serve men in heaven. And they do that even now on this earth. And so why would Satan have a problem with that? Because in the end, what it means is that you're going to be better than him. You're going to be lifted up above him. You're going to be better when it's all said and done. Do you guys see that? Do you guys follow me there? And so I can only imagine Satan seeing this. This is where it gets deeper, where he, he's counting the cost and saying, wait, wait, wait a minute. I'm the best. I, I'm the most adorned. I'm the guardian cherub. And mankind is going to be lifted up above me. And where does he have a problem with this? In that uh, he was unwilling to be a servant. He was unwilling to be humble. So what does he do? He talks to a third of the angels in heaven and convinces them to fight back against God. Saying, you know what? I don't, I don't want things to be like this way. 
I don't want to have to serve. I don't want to have to humble myself and be put below these, these creatures that God is creating. And there was war in heaven. And God kicks out a third of the angels in heaven. Satan gets kicked out with, with, and, the, and the angels that went with him. So what we even see there is that God was, uh, that Satan was even able to talk angels into following him and opposing God in this matter. Isn't that incredible? And uh, so even in heaven, the angels had a choice in the same way that we have a choice. And so I think the, the lesson here is that um, it's like, man, why? This is the lesson that Satan refused to learn is, is that he had to humble himself to exalt and serve other people. And, um, and this is why he's too embarrassed for it, and he doesn't want anyone to know about it because what does that mean that we guys, you guys are better than Satan. You guys are better than him. But how often in our heads do we start to think just negative thoughts about, man, I'm, I'm just, I'm a disgusting person. I'm just, I'm so sinful. I'm the worst. I'm not good enough. I hate myself. I'm too ugly. I'm not good enough. How many times can we have these self-degrading thoughts in our minds that are really just attacks from Satan, the great accuser? That's all that he is, who accuses them before our God day and night with these terrible thoughts. I can't do it. That's not God. That's Satan. I can't overcome. I won't be good enough. That's all Satan, and he's trying to put us down. But the victory in all of this is seeing that, man, we are better. We are above this. We are God's creation. Each and every one of us were made in his image. Are you with me, guys? And I can relate where I wrestle with so many of these negative and negative thoughts. And I lose the mental battle. But it's because Satan doesn't want me to know that I'm better. I can overcome. We can do this. We're each and every one of us deep down, but we got to see it. We got to believe it. It's like God believes in us, but do we believe in ourselves? And that we can overcome. That at the end of the day, each and every one of us are prophets. Do we believe that? We're made in the image of God. We're messengers of God. We represent him. We are awesome. There are great qualities about us because God made us. It's the truth. But where it gets even crazier is that despite how awesome we are, what is Jesus' attitude? Turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Verse 3. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the Father and the church said, Amen. But what we see here is that even in being exalted in this way, God is to be exalted in the greatest possible way. But what does he choose to do? God chooses to humble himself. To make himself nothing and to become a servant. And now this is the lesson that Satan never understood. Is he was exalted, but he was never willing to humble himself and serve. 
And very quickly, if we don't embrace this mindset of Jesus, we can be like Satan in not wanting to humble ourselves and serve at a greater capacity to make ourselves nothing. Too often we try to make ourselves more instead of making ourselves less. And really what I want to hit on is the heart to serve. Is it our heart to lower ourselves and to serve to, to, to the greatest extent, to the greatest degree, to humble ourselves, to, to drive the extra mile, to, to pick up a brother, to bring him to a Bible study, to share our faith with an extra person wherever we go, to make yourself nothing to everybody, to spend extra time encouraging a brother who's down, to make the extra effort to go visit him, to love up on him and see how he's doing, to call people. To encourage our sisters and take care of them. And especially with, with special missions. To take the extra effort to know that it's not about us. To humble ourselves and go the extra mile to fundraise. And whatever it takes, we've got 10 days. It's possible. You know, I want to lift up Belmont Lewis. This week. He's working an extra overnight shift from 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. for special missions. He's going the extra mile. You know, I know many brothers and sisters are, are, are giving plasma. We're, we're, we're cutting back in our spending. We're giving to God. It's amazing. And, uh, and this really has to be our hearts, guys, guys special missions. we got to knock it out. And with that, that's basically my lesson Let's humble ourselves. Let's serve. And to God be all the glory. Love you guys. Well, uh, amen, guys. Uh, great job, Hugo and uh, Nick. Uh, this is round three. Uh, my title for tonight is One Message, One Time, One Boat. Uh, let's go to Genesis chapter 5. You know, it's cool that uh, the last two lessons were talked about in the Old Testament. Uh, I think that's something in common. Uh, Genesis chapter 6, uh, verse 5. It says, The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. So the Lord said, I will wipe from the face of the earth the human race I have created, and with them the animals, the birds, and the creatures that move along the ground, for I regret that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. You know, we find here in this passage that God finds the world wicked. I mean, it's not just in today, but back in the Bible. And he feels deeply troubled. You see, this parallels to Jesus and the great Gethsemane, right? He feels troubled because he understands that the wrath of God is about to come. And so God feels greatly troubled because there's wickedness. But he finds one man to be righteous. You see, if God were to look down on earth, will he find it to be righteous? You know, we can come to church, we can come to midweeks, and we can all, you know, capture the zeal of this brother next to you. And we can be all fired up. But does God see your righteousness when you're alone? Does God see you being pure when you're alone? You see, God is looking for that person to be righteous. And so God finds Noah, and we continue reading here in verse 9. It says, this is the account of Noah and his family. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked faithfully with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Shabbat. Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people on earth had corrupted their ways. So God said to Noah, I am going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of him. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. 
this is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. Make a roof for it, leaving below the roof and opening one cubit high all around. Put a door in the side of the ark and make lower, middle, and upper decks. I am going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens, every creature that has the breath of life in it. Everything on earth will perish. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. You are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, and to keep them alive with you. Two of every kind of bird, of every kind of animal, and of every kind of creature that moves along the ground will come to you and be kept alive. You are to take every kind of food that is to be eaten and store it away as food for you and for them. Noah did everything just as God commanded him. Wow, long passage. Uh, but we find here that, that Noah has an amazing encounter with God. And so God comes up to him, and God tells Noah, hey, get ready, because I'm about to baptize the whole earth. I'm about to bring the flood. And so you got to get ready. Get and build an ark. Now, that's a huge responsibility. And so we see in the Bible, God only tells him one time the message and doesn't come back. Like, can you imagine? I mean, I, I lose concentration really quickly, you know? <laughs> like, like I, I can think of other things when someone talks to me at times, like, oh, no, like, hey, it's like, pay attention. And so this is a big message that God is telling No, I'm sure he's taking notes, amen? And so he's telling me, build an ark. How? A hundred percent. And it's so awesome, the Bible says he did as God commanded him. You know, it's crazy that in those times, they didn't understand that. A flood? Are you kidding me? It's going to rain? That didn't happen back then. And so Noah had to come and build. I don't know how he got the wood. Maybe he had to pay. I have no idea. But he gathered the wood. He gathered the tools and built this amazing ark. But we understand because the world is wicked. You see, this is a foreshadowing of the current spiritual reality that we live in today. Right? We are building the ark. What is it? The church. What is it made of? People. How does it need to be built completely? Is it okay we only build it 80%? I mean, that's, that's a passing grade for students. You know? Right? Do we leave some holes in our discipleships? No, no, we got to build it 100%. Why? Because we got to survive the wrath of God. Because next time he comes, he's, gonna, he's not going to bring the water. He's going to bring the fire. And, and we got to be ready to build God's church completely. You see, uh, for Noah, it took 75 years building this ark. I mean, that's a lot of years. I mean, he probably told his sons to come and work with him. Like, you're not going to school. You're going to work full time with me. Uh, every day, day in and day out, just working, working, working every single day. I mean, can you imagine that? Noah had to build this ark every day despite maybe people making fun of him. Like, no, are you serious? Why are you building an ark? Maybe God said an ar uh, a park. Yeah, that, yeah. Like, get a dog park. It's better for you. It's easy, you know. Or, or maybe, this, maybe he had to go through just being tired, right? Maybe just remember, what did Jesus really, I mean, what did God really tell me, really? You know, he had to go over this for 75 years and not hearing anything from God. Yet no one understood that one message, and he only needed to hear it one time. You see, how many times do we have to listen to the same discipling, the same direction, the same advice, the same situation that you see in front of your disciple and tell you, hey, you got to repent of the same sin. And yet we continue to do it again and again. You see, it took about 75 years for Noah to build the ark. One message, one time for 75 years. That's hard work. That's hard work. How long are we willing to, to become a, be a disciple? Right? When we say, Jesus is Lord, we didn't say for three years. We didn't say once a week. 
We say until the day we die, man. And so Noah was ready, ready to work every day to build God's church. And we got to do the same, build God's church. You see, I believe that when we're not building God's church, we don't really understand God's message. Right? God comes to us and he says, build my church. And at times when we're not really building God's church is because we don't hear his voice. We have to understand that this is the Bible. This is where we hear God speak to us. This is the message. And so we have to understand that one message until the day we die. Let's go to Genesis 7, verse 1. It says, The Lord said to Noah, Go into the ark, you and your whole family, because I have found you righteous in this generation. Take with you seven pairs of every kind of clean animal, and male and its mate, one pair of every kind of unclean animal, and male and its mate, and also seven pairs of every kind of bird, male and female, to keep their various kinds alive throughout the earth. Seven days from now, I will send rain on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. I will wipe from the face of the earth every living creature I have made. And Noah did all that the Lord commanded him. Noah was 600 years old when the floodwaters came on the earth. And Noah and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives entered the ark to escape the waters of the flood. Pairs of clean and unclean animals, of birds and all, create, and all, create, uh, and all creatures that, that move along the ground. Male and female came to Noah and entered the ark, as God had commanded Noah. And after seven days, the flood waters came on the earth. In the 600 year of Noah's life, on the 17th day of the second month, on that day all the springs of the great deep burst forth, and the floodgates of the heavens were open, and rain fell on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. On that very day, Noah and his sons, Shem, Hav, and Shaveth, together with his wife and the wives of his three sons, entered the ark. They had with them every wild animal according to its kind, all livestock according to its kind, every creature that moves along the ground according to its kind, and every bird according to its kind, everything with wings, pairs of all creatures that have breath of life in them, came to Noah and entered the ark. The animals going in were male and female of every living thing, as God had commanded Noah. Then the Lord shut him in. This is awesome. It says that the Lord shut the door. And so, <laughs> amen. But what we find here at the next chapter, 75 years of building the ark. Now God calls Noah again, the second time. And what does he tell them? Hey, Noah, you better get the ark ready because you only have two weeks before I bring the water. I mean, wow. Can you imagine if he wasn't done? What if, what if he was at 30%? I'll be panicking. I'll be like, what? Like, let's get some espresso shots and let's get to work. Like, like, what am I doing? There's no alternative here. There's no other solution here. This depends on Noah. Because we see that if Noah built the ark completely, not only is he, is, is he saved, but also his family. You see, we're building the church not because of you, but because of your friends and family. You see, the kingdom is not about you. It's about those who are lost. And so Noah understood that. He said, I got to build it 100%. Because the day when it comes, oh boy, I'm going to have my family with me. But we see here that he built it 100%. But what if he built it 95%? Will it survive? You see, whatever we, we make will be tested by God. What if Noah built a park instead of an ark? Will that go well? I mean, think about it. I think some of us brothers are building parks. I, I, I think we're focused on building your own life instead of the kingdom. You, you make dreams and goals and visions, but you don't put God in the picture. And so when it's about to be tested, you get demolished and destroyed. And so God says, hey, you got to get the ark ready. But what if you're like, no, you're not, you're about 
and you're struggling, you're stressed out, you're like, uh, you're telling your buddies to come and work with you. And so imagine that scenario. And that's how it is when we're two weeks away from missions. You know, I, I, I pray, brothers, I pray that we're not at 20%. Or a zero percent with your missions. Amen. This is very true, guys. I, I, I believe that if, if you're not really building God's kingdom, then shame on you. Because we're supposed to be the brothers that the life, the world depends on us to build God's church. I don't want you to be stressed out. Oh, one week away, let me donate my kidney. You know, let, let, let me sell an organ. Like, no, bro, you had months to build God's church, to hit your missions. I want us to be the brothers that we're not at 30% with our missions, but we're at 80 and above as we complete our missions next Sunday, man. You see, the kingdom here is to save many of every kind. One boat. There's no alternatives. We need to continue to build God's church to save so many people of all colors. We need more Bobs in the church, amen. You know, we need more Nicks in the church. We need more every kind of disciples in the church. Do you want to be like Noah? Do you want to be a man who listens to God and obeys immediately? Do you want to be like Noah who built the ark completely? Do you want to be like Noah, who understood the message, understood that there's only one solution, but as well we find here that he was a man, one man. You see, to make a difference in the world, it just takes one man. We are here, to get, we are here together because of Noah. Honestly, if Noah didn't do this, we wouldn't be here. And so we find here in this passage that you are the change. You can build God's church. You know the one solution. Brothers, brothers let us be men, men who are like Noah. As we complete God's church, as we blow out special missions, as we continue to advance God's gospel and to God be all the glory.